So, um, so the play, in the end, it pits Hotspur and Hal and two different notions of, uh, of how to be in the world, of how to be princely, royal, honorable, chivalrous, all this kind of stuff, right? So on the one hand, you've got uh, Hotspur, who is not the most complex character in the world, right? I mean, he is, he is a, a kind of one-dimensional figure of honor and chivalry. Um, he's hot-blooded, hot-headed. This is why he has the, the nickname Hotspur. Um, but, you know, he, um, he, is, he is the theme of honor's tongue. Um, the, the Scots leader, Douglas, is going to call him the king of honor. Right? So all the things we think of as military honor, military glory, military chivalry, these are associated with Hotspur and not with Hal, right? Hal is the opposite, the inverse, the, the, the other side of the coin from, uh, from Hotspur. He is a degenerate who hangs around with lowlifes. Uh, he partic participates in crimes. He doesn't seem to care about honor, glory, chivalry, anything like that. Um, now, of course, that's a pose, as, as I've suggested all along, right? I mean, it, it is, or at least it's in part, it seems to be a pose. Um, and so, um, you know, but in any case, they're set up as opposites, right? So Hotspur, he is a, you know, in Act 1, Scene 3, we see him as this man of action. Um, you see him in that, um, in Act 1, Scene 3, uh, at line, uh, well, on page 16, starting around line 29 and running through to 69. So it's a long speech, but he justifies, you know, his holding on to his prisoners because the guy who comes to ask him is this kind of, you know, foppish, uh, non, non-military figure, right? Who's a messenger from the king and who's there to demand his prisoners. And Hotspur doesn't respect him. In fact, you know, he actively kind of disdains him, um, because it's kind of an insult to his honor. Um, and then, um, you know, he loses his temper once the king leaves with this whole big thing about uh, Mortimer, Mortimer, Mortimer. Um, you see in Act 2, Scene 3, which is, he, he does, I mean, the, the little slightest bit of complexity in this uh, character is maybe around uh, his interactions with his wife, with Kate. Um, Act 2, Scene 3, this is on page 34. Um, he's reading a letter uh, about, you know, people who are kind of too lukewarm, too cowardly about joining the Percy's in the rebellion. And as he's going through it, um, that letter and, and kind of getting more and more worked up about it, in walks uh, his wife, Kate. How now, Kate, he says at line 34, I must leave you within these two hours. And the Lady Percy, oh, good, my lord, why are you thus alone, right? She wants to make the case that she is up to the task of being Hotspur's wife, right? So if he could, you know, share some of his uh, his anxieties, concerns, troubles with her, you know, that she would be a good partner for him. Um, but she's noticed, right, that he is keeping it all to himself and that it's having some kind of interior effect on him. Um, he's having nightmares. Um, he's talking in his sleep about battles and things like this. Um, you know, share your burden, she basically wants to ask him to do this. Um, she says at line 62, some heavy business hath my lord in hand, and I must know it, else he loves me not. And Hotspur, somewhat distracted, um, but, you know, she pushes on this. Hear you, my lord, she says at line 73. What sayest thou, my lady? What is it carries you away, she says at line 75. Why, my horse, my love, my horse, right? He can kind of make a joke about carried away, right? Carried away uh, in terms of his mental train of thought versus like literally what's going to carry him away to his meeting in Wales. Um, out, you mad-headed ape. A weasel hath uh, such a deal of spleen as thou art tossed with. And faith, I'll know your business, Harry. That I will. I fear my brother Mortimer doth stir about his title and hath sent for you to lie in his enterprise. But if you go so far afoot, I shall be weary, my love. So he's able to kind of make some jokes with her. I mean, it's... I, you know, uh, and in the end, right, he's not, um, he's not some kind of enlightened figure. I mean, he is still, uh, you know, there's a male sphere of masculine honor, chivalry, and that kind of thing versus, you know, the women's, uh, women's work and women's areas and so on. He's not going to, uh, share his thoughts with her. Um, he says in the, his kind of getting his valediction here, uh, act two, scene four, around line 100 or so, he says, whither I must, I must, right? I have to go where I have to go. And to conclude, this evening I must leave you, gentle Kate. I know you wise, but yet no further wise than Harry Percy's wife, right? You're a, a woman. Even though you're my wife, you're still a woman. You're not going to be able to kind of, you know, keep my secrets and so on. Constant you are, 
but yet a woman. And for secrecy, no lady closer. For well, I believe, thou wilt not utter what thou dost not know. And so far will I trust thee, gentle Kate. All right, so I'm going to save you from the temptation to prattle like women do. I'm not going to give you this information. I mean, it's, I mean, it's not, it, it's sort of like, uh, oh, I don't know. I mean, it's sort of like, Shakespeare has some comedies where, you know, people are kind of trading barbs. They also seem to really love each other and have affection, but they're also, you know, saying some sort of insulting things to each other. I'm thinking here of a play like Much Ado About Nothing. Uh, okay. So um, anyway, so he's, you know, he's, he, he keeps his counsel. He is determined to do his thing. He is a jerk, right? He's a jerk to her. He's a jerk to Glendower in that in Act Three, Scene One. Um, when he hears, when he finally gets to the battle, uh, you know, he hears about um, the kind of person that Hal has turned himself into, right? Hal is in the process of transforming from that tavern-going playboy figure into this kind of serious, uh, you know, princely figure, and so on. Um, and so Vernon brings back, having had that mess, that meeting with the, the court, uh, Vernon and Worcester come back and they kind of shade the truth about what exactly was offered to them. Um, but then Vernon says that um, uh, in the midst of that council, this is Act 5, Scene 2, we're on page 103, Act 5, Scene 2, around line 45. Um, you know, Worcester, he's trying to rile Hotspur up. He says, the Prince of Wales stepped forth before the king and nephew challenged you to single fight, right? So one of the things that Hal does is offer a kind of hand-to-hand, -hand, you know, a duel one-on-one -on -one to, to decide the victory and save a lot of bloodshed. Um, but that's going to be turned down here. Uh, Hotspur on, is on page 104, uh, 48 of Act 5, Scene 2. Um, oh, would the quarrel lay upon our heads, and that no man might draw a uh, short breath today, but I and Harry Monmouth. Tell me, tell me, how showed his tasking? Seemed it in contempt, Ray? Right? Was he, you know, disgracing me, not giving me the proper honor, respect, loyalty, uh, not uh, glory, and that kind of thing? And Vernon, no, by my soul, I never in my life did hear a challenge urged more modestly unless a brother should a brother dare to gentle exercise and proof of arms. He gave you all the duties of a man, trimmed up your praises with a princely tongue, spoke your deservings like a chronicle, right? So uh, Vernon kind of talks about the fact that ha that Hal sort of unexpectedly seems to be in inhabiting this role of Prince of Wales, you know, giving Hotspur his due and so on. Um, and Hotspur's response to this kind of long praise of Hal is at line 69, Cousin, I think thou art enamored upon his follies. Never did I hear of any prince so wild a liberty, right? I know that this guy was a scumbag hanging around in taverns and doing uh, dirty deeds with his friends and so on. What's come over you that you're so enamored of this guy? Um, okay, so that's the thing. How has Hal transformed himself? Um, so... Um, Skipping back to to the to kind of go back to where we started today, um, Hal and uh, the the king do have their interview, right? Where the king scolds Hal for um, for popularity, for um, for not acting like a prince is supposed to act, and so on, um, and um, and he he, I mean, kind of the final insult that he levels at Hal is at line. Uh, this is Act 3, Scene 2, it's on page 72, Act 3, Scene 2, around line 126, that, you know, people thought, and by that he means I thought, that you would fight against me under Percy's pay to dog his heels and curtsy at his frowns to show how much thou art degenerate, right? Like, in order to prove yourself to be anti-me, which is, you know, just how fathers and sons are, um, and whatever, but, you know, maybe you would have actually gone and joined the rebel forces against me. And the and Hal's response, like he's hurt by that accusation, right? And he responds at uh, at at 129, do not think so. You shall not find it so. And God forgive them, the, the people who have been kind of getting this into your ear, God forgive them that so much have swayed your majesty's good thought away from me. And then here's a promise. I will redeem all this on Percy's head, and in the closing of some glorious day, be bold to tell you that I am your son. When I will wear a garment all of blood and stain my favors in a bloody mask, which, washed away, shall scour my shame with it, right? I will redeem myself on Percy's head. Now, recall, right, this is the, the same word that he uses back in the, the soliloquy in Act 1, Scene 2, where he's talking about having played this role, this redemption. I will redeem myself on Percy's head. Um, I'm going to get myself back into, um, into your good graces, and I'm going to prove myself to be a worthy... Uh, Prince of Wales and that kind of thing. 
Now, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to do this really kind of quickly. But, I mean, one of the things about Hal is, you know, because he, I mean, one way of thinking about Hal, right, is that he's this very cynical, manipulative kind of figure. He sees honor maybe not in quite the same way as Hotspur does, right? Um, he, In fact, so he says um, that he hopes that someday he'll get a chance to fight head-to-head -head with Hotspur, this child of, of honor, he says at line 139, this gallant Hotspur. Um, and then he says at, on page, uh, at line 142, this is the top of page 73, but uh, Act 3, Scene 2, line 43, that for every honor sitting on his helm, that is on Percy's helm, would they were multitudes, and on my head my shames redouble, right? All the things that have made people think uh, poorly of me. For the time will come that I shall make this northern youth exchange his glorious deeds for my indignities. Percy is but my factor, good my lord, to engross up glorious deeds on my behalf, and I will call him to so strict account that he shall render every glory up, yea, even the slightest worship of his time, or I will tear the reckoning from his heart. This in the name of God, I promise here. Now, and it goes on a little bit more from there, but one of the things that's really fascinating to me about this, uh, this speech, right, is that the language that uh, Hal is using about redemption Right? It's not coming from that language of, um, of spirituality, right? the spiritual redeemer, that kind of thing. He's talking here in redemption in terms of like pawn shops, you know, like uh, you know, how things get exchanged for money. Um, and he's thinking about honor not as a way of being, uh, an outlook, an attitude, but he's thinking about it in very kind of material terms, like you could actually touch this, this stuff. And so the language that gets used here, um, the idea of um, an exchange, a factor, an account, a rendering, a reckoning, those, that's all language that's drawn from commerce, from, from economic exchanges, right? And I'm going to buy my honor by um, defeating Percy, right? So, I mean, it's an interesting uh, uh, register or choice of metaphors that Hal makes here. These come out of the idea of buying and selling, which is not how honor is supposed to work, at least, you know, in that kind of chivalry, glorious military honor kind of way. Um, and so when Hal and Hotspur finally um, uh, confront each other, and this is in Act 5, Scene 4 at line 60, um, Right, so uh, it's in the middle of the battle. Um, various characters have been fighting at this point. Um, and um, Hal is alone on stage here at line 58. Enter, and he's alone on stage. This is Act 5, Scene 4, line 58. It's page 111. Alone on stage, and Hotspur comes in. If I mistake not, thou art Henry Monmouth, Harry Monmouth, Prince. Thou speak, Hal. Thou speaks as if um, I would deny my name, Hotspur. My name is Harry Percy, right? Like I am, you know, I'm you know, this honorable military figure. And how? Why then I see a very valiant rebel of the name. I am the Prince of Wales, and think not, Percy, to share with me in glory any more. Two stars cannot keep their motion in one sphere. This is a, a, a an astronomy reference. Um, nor can one England brook a double reign of Harry Percy and the Prince of Wales. Hotspur, nor shall it, Harry, for the hour has come to end one of us, and would to God uh, thy name, thy name in arms were now as great as mine, right? I'm about to do some uh, some fighting with you. I wish that you were my equal so that this would count for something. The prince, I'll make it greater ere I part from thee, and all the budding honors on my crest I'll crop to make a garland for my head. Oh, so all the budding honors on thy crest I'll crop, I'll crop to make a garland for my head. I can no longer brook thy vanities. They fight. Falstaff comes in and watches them fight. Hotspur, uh, sorry, uh, Harry kills him. Hal kills him. And Hotspur gets his kind of death speech. Oh, Harry, thou hast robbed me of my youth. I better brook the loss of better life than those proud titles thou hast won for me. Right? So um, thou hast robbed me. Right? Is a, again, a, it's an interesting kind of way to talk about the idea of honor. Um, but the idea that, you know, I put all my effort into building up this great reputation and now you're going to take it from me and you're going to be the great victor of this uh, of this uh, campaign and, you know, I'm going to be forgotten, essentially, right? Okay, so um, just to kind of move towards an ending here then, the, um, the uh, Hal finally does redeem himself, right? That promise that he makes in that soliloquy at the beginning of the, of the play that we talked about, you know, that he's going to allow his reputation to be kind of sullied, muddied, 
you know, wrecked by the people that he's hanging out with so that when he emerges from it, it's, it's going to be even more significant, even more glorious, even more notable, the kind of reformation redemption that he's going to be able to accomplish. And um, one little tiny uh, sign of this is um, in the, um, just before this battle with Hotspur, um, when the, the king, who is himself fighting in the battle, right, the king and um, Hal, are, excuse me, are um, on stage together. And the Douglas, who's the the kind of actually sort of the most power, like, like most effective military figure in all of this kind of stuff, right? Um, he comes on stage, he's killed off. The king has, um, I mean, again, in a kind of metadramatic theatrical sort of way, right? The king has a whole bunch of doubles, right? A whole bunch of guys who are dressed like him um, to kind of confuse the enemy. Um, and the Douglas uh, has been going through and killing all these doubles, um, including Walter Bunt, Blunt. Um, and he comes across the king and he says, you know, are you the real king or one more of those doubles? I'm going to have to kill you. And they start to fight. And uh, and the Douglas, who's a great fighter, he's getting the better of the king when Hal arrives. This is uh, Act 5, Scene 4. It's on page 110. Uh, it's around line 36. The Douglas and the king fight, the king being in danger, right? That he's actually at risk of dying here. Enter the Prince of Wales. And the prince, hold up thy head, vile Scott, or thou art like never to hold it up again. The spirits of valiant Shirley, Stafford, Blunt, these are the, the fake kings that uh, that Douglas has already killed, are in my arms. It is the Prince of Wales that threatens thee, who never promised but he means to pay. They fight, and Douglas fleeth, right? He gets the better of the Douglas. And then Hal turns to his father, just as he's promised in that uh, Act 3, Scene 2. Cheerly, my lord, how fair is your grace. Sir Nicholas Gauzy hath for succor sent, and so hath Clifton, all to Clifford Street. And the king, stay and breathe a while. Thou hast redeemed thy lost opinion, and showed thou makest some tender of my life, and this fair rescue thou hast brought to me. Again, that language of redemption, right? Of 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 uh, coming back from this um, from this uh, reputation of you know of of a wasted youth and so on. Thou hast redeemed thy lost opinion. Right? He could, if Hal was like the king had said in Act Three, Scene Two. He could just have let Douglas get the better of him and uh, of the king and kill him, right? But instead, he's risked his own life to save the kings at this point. And the prince, or Hal, at uh, 50, Oh God, they did me too much injury that ever said, I hearken for your death. If it were so, I might have left alone the insulting hand of Douglas over you, which would have been as, uh, as speedy in your end as all the poisonous potions in the world and saved the tre treacherous labor of your son. Right? So there's this... It's a, just a short little scene, right? But it's it's one where Hal has finally, you know, re he's redeemed himself, right? He is, uh, he's got the king thinking in, uh, in his favor and so on. Um, he's done the right thing. He's done the honorable and princely thing, um, that sort of thing. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, there's a little bit more beyond this play, right? There's uh, there's a sequel to this play, Henry IV Part II. Um, it, ha it has a similar structure to this one. You know, Hal goes back to hanging out with the... the uh, the 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 wastrels and so on in East Cheap, um, and then you know redeems himself again by the end, and then at the end of that play he becomes Henry V, and then there's a the final part of the Henry ad is a play that's devoted to the the famous victory that um, that Henry V has over the French at Agincourt, um, and it sort of re it represents a kind of a, a, a temporary high point for the English monarchy. Agincourt is one of kind of the one of the battles in the kind of the repertoire of of you know English greatness, sort of like Valley Forge for Americans or something like that, right? This kind of great moment of overcoming um, adversity and so on. Um, so on Thursday.